at this time, I like what Pastor Don has done in the past. He, he, encouraged, he encourages testimonies to be told. And I know I've told a couple here and there, but it, just being up here and having a chance to speak to you guys, I, I want to open up my heart a little bit and share a little bit of a testimony with you guys before I branch off into the actual lesson I prepared. So please bear with me. Um, I grew up in church, um, was saved when I was about 11, 12 years old, um, but the thing that I remember the most, probably the best memories I have as a teen come from the youth group that, uh, that I was in at Abundant Life Baptist Church, started it. Uh, my parents split up when I was 11. My mom stopped going to church. My dad stopped going to church. But that year I turned 12. I was allowed in the youth group, so I asked and was allowed to continue to go on Wednesday nights. I didn't go on Sunday mornings. I didn't go on Sunday evenings. Wednesday nights were the nights that I went to youth group. Um, and that became my family. Um, the youth pastor that we had at the time, Rick Friesen. No, we didn't call him Brother Rick. No, he wasn't Pastor Rick. He was just Rick, which was fine by me. Uh, that's just how he addressed us. And he became a very close friend, became almost like a father figure to me during this time while I was in the youth group. And it was as it was as I finished up my junior year, before I started my senior year, we went to teen camp. I'd gone to all the teen camps before, but that teen camp in particular touched my heart, touched my life, because it was at that teen camp that I committed my life to God. I'd already been saved, but I committed to God to, if he was going to call me into the ministry, I would go. If he wanted to be a missionary, I would go. What I truly felt led to do, though, was to be a youth leader. I loved Rick. I, I respected him, and I wanted to be like him. It was a few months after that, had a bit of a falling out with him. He made a couple of decisions that I didn't agree with in my wisdom at 17. And I, I think I did handle it appropriately because I didn't call him out in church. I didn't call him out. Um, and tried to badmouth him. I just called him up on the phone and tried to have a conversation with him, saying, hey, I, I think you're making a mistake here. Um, I really wish you'd reconsider this. this um, it, and it affected a lot of the friends that I had, both in church and outside of church. But during this phone conversation, it didn't go as I had planned it to, probably because, again, I was 17 and didn't handle it as well as I should have. And I don't remember what was said, but I remember the takeaway from that was that he felt I had betrayed him as uh, just as his friend. And for the longest time, we didn't talk. It, I, I lasted in youth group for a few more months, watched friends walk away, watched my girlfriend and her family leave the church. And yes, I'm pointing to Christina, because she was my girlfriend at the time. Now she's my wife. Um, and it was towards the end of the school year where I just, you know what? I can't do this anymore. And I walked away. I walked away from Abundant Life. I walked away from the youth group. I walked away from Rick. I walked away from church. And guess what? I walked away from God doing that. I spent, or went off to college, got married, had kids. I spent close to almost 10 years, 10 years outside of church because that one bad instance. I spent 10 years outside of church until... We moved here to Bakersfield, and God truly did call us to be part of McKeebo ba Baptist Church, to start coming, and we, I mean, we only had a riot at the time. We didn't officially become members of the church till what was it, three weeks, four weeks after Brody was born, so that we could join up together as a family. Christy was pregnant at the time that we started uh, coming here, and it was just uh, between my job and just life in general, it was hard to join up. So we waited until he was born, and now here I am, 15 years, roughly, since the time I committed to God to be a youth pastor, and now here I am today, finally, a youth pastor. It's weird how God works, because throughout those 10 years, I never thought he'd have any use for me. The past five years, I've slowly kind of, I've, I've taken over teaching Sunday school, I've led a few songs, kind of filled in where I can here and there, but I never once expected to be here as a youth pastor. I'll tell you what, it's a lot of fun. I, like I said, my best memories are being in the youth group, 
15 years ago. And guess what? 15 years later, as an adult, I get to be back in the youth group. I get to have a lot of fun <laughs> with the teens. And I'm enjoying every moment. I'm excited to be here with these teens. They can tell you. I've told them multiple times, probably just about every Sunday now, that I am happy to be here. I'm excited to be here with you guys. And I hope that you will that you as a church will encourage these teens to be excited for the youth group, that you'll encourage me because I definitely need y'all's encouragement in order to do this. And I pray that you just keep the teens in prayer as we try to build the youth group, as we try to raise these young men and women up to stay with God, to not make the same mistakes I did. Please keep them in your prayers and keep me in your prayers because I definitely need them. And with that, I'll go ahead and open up in a word of prayer and we'll get into our lesson tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for today. Lord, pray that you'd help me. Pray that you'd speak to me, you'd speak through me. Lord, and that this wouldn't be my words, it would be yours. That you'd speak to the lives, to the hearts of the men and women, the children here tonight. Lord, and just give me a strength to speak, to speak clearly and speak all that you've laid on my heart. Pray that you'd bless us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Go ahead and open up your Bibles, because I'm, I'm going to um, kind of, not necessarily rehash, but I want to touch on some things that we've been going over on Sunday nights. Sunday nights we've been going over a lot of Joseph, and there's just something in Joseph that captured my attention. And I kind of want to share that insight with you guys tonight. There's five words that you see in the Bible all the time. And we might not necessarily pay attention to them all the time, but... We were with the teens, what was this, uh, not last Friday, but the Friday before, watching Mark Lowry. Any, anyone here ever heard of Mark Lowry, other than my teens? We got one back here, got a couple back here. He's a Christian Baptist singer. He uh, was in the Dave, oh, Bill Gaither, I'm sorry, I actually know a Dave Gaither, I'm sorry. Bill Gaither uh, vocal band, he was part of that uh, back in the day, but he is also a comedian, and he's got some funny stuff. And one of the things, and, and in his bits, he has some serious moments. He has some songs. He has a lot of humor in his, in his uh, just little commentary, his dialogue. There we go. That, I think that's the word I was looking for. It's what comedians do. Um, and he brought up these five words, and it just kind of, it all clicked together. I kind of want to share this insight with you. So these five words are found throughout the Bible. They're found when you read about Noah and the flood. Just before you get to hear about Noah and the flood, you see these five words. Just before the birth of Moses, you see these five words. Just before God prepares Moses to speak to Pharaoh, just before the pl ten plagues come down on Egypt, you see these five words. You see these five words throughout the book of Judges. You see these five words in the life of David, in the life of the kings of Israel and of Judah. You see these five words in the ministry of Jesus and throughout the Acts of the Apostles. These five words, sometimes they bring hope. Sometimes they bring love. Sometimes they foretell joy coming into the lives of these men and women in the Bible. Sometimes what they're just, they're pointing out is that there's going to be pain and sorrow coming up. These five words, you, might have, you may have heard this message before. And I'm sorry if you've had, but maybe I can give you some insight. These five words. And it came to pass. And it came to pass. Those five words. Five simple words. But they always represent a moment of change coming in the lives of the men and women in the, in the Bible. And I want to touch base with you guys on Genesis. Back here uh, in Joseph. Genesis chapter 39. If I can get my Bible to the right page. I did a little bit of studying on this, and those five words, and it came to pass, show up in the Bible roughly 120, 130 times, somewhere around that. They show up 20 times around the life of Joseph. Roughly 20. That's 10% of this phrase being here with the life of Joseph. And each time it is said, it is a big change. It's not just he's growing up. It is a huge, monumental change in the life of Joseph as God is leading him, through his, uh, leading him through his life. In Genesis chapter 39, verse 11, at this point, Joseph is a slave in the house of Potiphar. In verse 11, and it came to pass, 
those five words. About this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she came, or she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Joseph has been a slave in Potiphar's house for, I don't know, several years probably at this point. We don't actually know the timeline. All we know is that a certain amount of time has passed. And now Potiphar's wife is trying to sleep with David. Or with Joseph, not with David, with Joseph. And if you continue on in the story in verse 19, and it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. I, we've been here Sunday night. We've heard the story of Joseph. We've heard how he was sold into slavery by his brothers, how he lived a life as a slave in Potiphar's house. And now as his life is what he thought was probably the lowest, is now going to get even lower. I, it, this was a time and place where Potiphar could have chosen to kill Joseph. Potiphar was well within his rights to kill Joseph, to strangle him in his sleep. And you know what anyone else would have done? They would have helped. They would have helped hold Joseph down so Potiphar could do that because Joseph was a slave. But instead, even though Joseph is being cast out of Potiphar's house, he still has his life. And now, he lives, and now he's going to live this life in that prison. And if you continue on with this story, in the next big change in Joseph's life, in chapter 40, in verse 1, and it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. This is another big change in Joseph's life. Remember, Joseph has had dreams before. He told those dreams to his brothers and didn't interpret them. All he did was tell the dream to his brothers. God didn't give him that gift of interpretation. But here at this point in that prison, you see a turning point in Joseph's life. Because now God is giving him the ability to interpret the, interpret the dreams of the butler and the baker. The next story, Genesis 41, verse 1. And it came to pass at the end of the two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. You guys know this part of the story? Pharaoh's had a dream. No one can interpret it except for Joseph. All of these changes, all of these instances, these major events in Joseph's life are foreshadowed in our Bible, by those five words. And it came to pass. Each time brought change. Each time was God preparing Joseph to move forward in his ministry. Now, when, when I see these five words, I, there's a lot of signs, a lot of symbols that, you, that I see in these five words. Maybe you'll see more, maybe you'll see less. I see three specific. So these three I want to share with you guys tonight. The first symbol, the first sign, is a sign of change. Our life is made up of changes, both good and bad. So picture life like a wave as you're going along. And yes, I stole this bit from Mark Lowry, so if you've seen it, I'm sorry, but I enjoyed it and I figured I'd share with you guys tonight. Life is change. Sometimes you have valleys, sometimes you have mountains. And as we go along, we travel through each one, as it comes to pass. But the Bible says in John chapter 10, verse 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. So picture this. Life going along, valleys and mountains. With God, with Jesus, it's a bit more abundant. We have our life the valleys and the mountains might get just a little bit more <laughs> significant in our lives. But here's the thing. When you focus on these five words, and it came to pass, you realize that as you're coming into these valleys, whether you're at the beginning of the valley or whether you're at rock bottom, it will pass. 
it will pass. Because that's how life works. It's not the end. There's joy still to come as you go back up that mountain slope. And remember, as you're at the top of that mountain, to enjoy it while you're there. Because there's a valley coming for you. So enjoy those moments. Enjoy those times with your kids, with your family, whatever those high points are. Enjoy them as they come. One of my favorite sections of the Bible, passages of the Bible, I, I, I don't know why it speaks to me, but it does. Would you guys turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 3? Ecclesiastes was written by, arguably, the wisest man who ever lived, by King Solomon. But when you get to the book of Ecclesiastes, you've got Proverbs, you've got Song of Solomon, all of them have a lot of hope in it. But when you get into Ecclesiastes, you've got a lot of just sorrow and despair in the life of Solomon. But for whatever reason, these, uh, this passage really speaks to me. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. Ever since I was a teen, for whatever reason, this passage had spoken to me. There is a purpose. There is a time for your sorrow. But there's a time for your joy. They are opposites, but they come together. You can't have one without having the other. God will give you both in your life. You'll have a time of love and a time of hatred. And sadly, there's going to be times for that in your life too but you'll also have those times of love. You'll have those times of joy. Life is those mountains and valleys. And if you hold on, don't give in to despair. Because your joy is coming once more. It is coming. As soon as this time that you're in comes to pass. The second symbol that I see when I, when I read these words is that this is a sign of history, a sign of truth. Just whenever I see it written in the Bible, it just rings true for me. That, read the story of Joseph, and you see these times where it came to pass. Each time symbolizing that time has passed. We know for Joseph's life, specifically, he was 17 when he was a slave. He was 30 when he was freed. I have no idea when he was put in prison. I have no idea how long he sat in prison before he met the butler and the baker. We do know that it was two years after he met the butler and baker before he was freed. So by that, by my calculations, we got 28 years. From 17 to 28 years encompass his life as a slave and his life as a prisoner. And the only words we have are that it came to pass. You've got to realize, this isn't a fairy tale. This isn't a story that we tell our children. This isn't, you know, where the hero gets some magic sword and he goes off to slay the dragon and he lives his life happily ever after without, you know, stopping to eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, use the restroom, take a nap, any of that stuff that we tell in our fairy tales, that we tell in our stories, unless there's a purpose for the hero to rest. These are real people. These are real stories from their lives. So there is time in between the major events that we have recorded and each time this happens, we see these five words. And it came to pass. That part was true. It is their past. This part is happening. It will be their past. It is true. The events are the focus, but the life has continued on in between those moments. And what I say about Joseph, how 
each one of these instances have happened. Each one of these have come to pass. The same is true for this whole book here. Other than, I don't know, the book of Revelations, parts of Daniel, and I think a few passages here and there, this entire book has come to pass. This entire book you have in your hand, it is our history. It is our stories. It is our heritage as Christians. Right here that I hold in my hand. 3,500 years worth of history we have in our hands. Each and every instance has come to pass. Finally, the third thing that this kind of symbolizes to me, er, that, that it's a sign of, it's a sign of vanishing. Turn with me, if you will, to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 14. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanish away. We don't have long on this earth. Our life is but a vapor that vanisheth away. Millions, billions of people have come before you. Billions of people will come after you. How will you live your life? How will you live a life that's different than theirs? Will you live a life following God? Live a life that's pleasing and glorifying to God? Or will you live a life for yourself? To please yourself. Do what you can when you can because nothing else matters. And your life won't matter in the end. If your life is but a vapor, then what about your friends? What about your neighbor? What about your family? If your life is but, but a vapor, isn't theirs as well? Hebrews 9, 27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Every one of us will sit before that throne of judgment. Some will have the mediator come forth and say, This man should be set free. His debt has been paid. Others won't get that opportunity. Others won't get that chance to. Our lives are but a vapor, and eventually it will pass. Will your life have meaning? Will you live a life glorifying to God? Will you tell somebody whose life is but a vapor what it means to follow God? I, I, I want to finish off on this story right here. It's a story that I've heard told by, uh, it, it's usually attributed to Abraham Lincoln. At least that's the way I heard it. There's a story he told at one of, his, uh, one of his speeches that a great king decided to mark a glorious reign, a, a time of peace and a time of just greatness in his kingdom. So he's going to build a monument, a monument that would last forever. And he came to the wisest men in his kingdom and asked them to come up with something. Come up with something that a thousand years from now will still ring true. And we will put it on this monument so that all men may see it. All men may know the glory of this kingdom. These wise men got together. And on that monument, they printed these words. And this too shall pass. Nothing lasts. Nothing but God and his glory. I would encourage us all to live a life filled with joy, filled with God and his power and his might. Live a life that would glorify God, knowing that no matter what happens in your life, whether you're near that mountain or your valley, that this too will pass. Close in a word of prayer.